In 2014's Fury, Brad Pitt aims to finish off the German army of the Second World War, which is two things. One of the coolest trims in cinema history and an M4 Sherman tank full of your favorite actors. But when the tank is grounded by a mine, and when even Brad Pitt's hair isn't enough to seduce the enemy, they have to make a last stand against an entire battalion of SS combatants to save World War II. Oh, sorry, sir. And as a whole, Fury is not only one of my favorite movies, but also hands down one of the best war movies ever. Which is a tall task for any movie in any genre to pull off, because in every genre, there are movies that have set the bar so high that realistically, it can never be met. Yet, somehow, by utilizing some secret filmmaking trick, life, I mean, uh, Fury, finds a way. And to be clear, as I always say, there are many reasons why this movie is so awesome. Everything from the music, to the cinematography, to the atmosphere, to the level of physical production is simply incredible. Even the cast members are not only amazing, but also amazingly dedicated, to the point where Shia LaBeouf was <laughs> refusing to shower for weeks on end and pulling his teeth out of his mouth, even though no one asked him to. Yesterday, you said tomorrow, so just do it! Make your dreams come true! But since I now finally have a chance to talk about this movie, thanks to a mysterious benefactor that wanted me to talk about it, hmm, I wonder who that can be. Maybe we'll find out later. The thing I want to talk about is the trick this movie pulls to become one of the faces of its genre. A trick that all of us can utilize no matter the genre we want to shine in. A trick called picking an angle. That angle for Fury is right there in the title. It's Fury, it's the tank. This is a tank war movie. And everything it does, everything it builds, it does through this angle with incredible results. Results like sequences you can't experience in this manner anywhere else. Sequences including arguably one of the greatest boss battles across all genres. So today, let's investigate some key ways Fury uses the angle of being a tank war movie to make itself shine more than 99% of others in the genre. Here's how to pick and play the angle of your movie to stand out in any genre. The first key thing Fury does is establish clearly understandable rules within its angle and then follow those rules to deliver a level of experience not otherwise possible. For example, a central quality about the Sherman tank introduced early on is its vulnerability. We open with text alluding to its expendable nature against the Germans and then fade into this graveyard of destroyed Shermans. An entire US tank platoon has been wiped out, with Brad Pitt's crew being the only survivor. Even that, not fully. Where's the rest of third platoon? We're it. And in this manner, all the following major tank scenes are very deliberately positioned to help the audience better understand the tank angle, what the Sherman can and cannot do. When the US tank column is rolling to their next destination, there's sudden German activity in their flank. With terrible consequences. <laughs> That's right, already we see that all it takes for these things to be stopped and cooked is one close-range German kid with a Panzerfaust. It's a very effective scene on its own, but at the same time, without the audience even realizing, it's establishing key specifics within the tank angle. It's highlighting the importance of infantry and how dangerous it is if the enemy gets close with launchers. You see what a kid can do? Look! Soon after, once Brad Pitt's crew has taken the lead of the column, they're assigned to rescue an infantry unit stuck on this nearby field. And again, on top of the value of the scene itself, there's a couple new vital bits of knowledge you learn here. When an enemy MG42 reveals its position to start blasting, it is dangerous for infantry of course, but not really a danger to us. It's not damaging the tank, the crew isn't too faced by it. It's more like a barking chihuahua for us to flick out of the way. Cease fire, target destroyed. 
But when the Germans reveal anti-tank cannons in a tree line, suddenly faces and the situation turn that much graver. Oh, that's crowd high velocity gun, I can hear it whistling. Now, the battle becomes this race against time to locate and destroy the cannons before they can get a direct hit, which again is a very cool scene on its own. But most importantly, consider what we now know. We know that if the enemy flanks us up close with a launcher, we're pretty much done. We know that MG gunners can't really do more than tickle us. We know that anti-tank cannons, even from a distance, are a proper threat that must be taken out as fast as possible. Those are the central rules of this angle, which we're now aware of, and which the movie can now utilize to really play with our feelings. This is big brain time. Later on, there's the scene where we roll into a village to liberate it from enemy activity that makes us feel a variety of things. We feel underlying tension because we know that around each corner could be a guy with a Panzerfaust to cook us immediately. <laughs> We feel incredibly empowered because we know that this little MG nest ahead can't do anything to us other than eat our express delivery. And we feel great rush to destroy this hidden anti-tank cannon before it has time to get more than a ricochet on us. As a whole, a pretty damn great sequence. But as an even better example, take the scene where we are traveling to our next objective only to run into an ambush of the worst kind. Hey! 12 o'clock, 800 yards! You see it? It's a goddamn tiger! Yeah, we're getting hunted by a tiger tank, which the movie builds upon the pre-established rules to use and further develop them. The tiger is using armor-piercing ordnance, which basically makes it a moving anti-tank cannon that can get us from anywhere. <laughs> whereas we don't seem to be able to hurt it even with a direct hit. So we gotta get close, we gotta get behind the tiger where it's weak, which we can do because its mounted MGs aren't really a problem. And we gotta do it right the f now before the tiger hits us with something more than a ricochet. Once again, a great scene on its own, but mostly so because of the details we know. Whereas if we kinda just drove toward the tiger and shot at it until it blew up as could have happened in any movie, it wouldn't be the same. It'd be like in that new Transformers movie. I just don't know whether it's a bad thing that a villain snatches one of the heroes into the air. I'm not aware of the rules. But as a whole, Phil Minto of course agrees that the new Transformers movie is amazing. He took a big L when he implied differently. Here, it's the specific knowledge of the tank angle that makes it effective. We know exactly what to feel. That's the power of setting up and utilizing the most central significant rules within your angle, scene after scene after scene. Or in video game terms, it's the difference between a game where you just shoot aimlessly, which you can do anywhere, and a game where it matters what you're shooting at, whether it's a Sherman or a Tiger. I see it, it's a goddamn Tiger! <laughs> Oh, and look at that. That's actually today's benefactor who allowed me to make this video, War Thunder. Basically, War Thunder is the biggest vehicle-based online war game out there that, by the way, you can play for free. It's free. If you're like me and you like Fury for its specificity and immersive production value, it's a lot like that. It has great graphics and really great sound design, I thought, as well as a custom-built combat system and destruction effects where strong points and weak points vary with each vehicle, much like the rules in Fury. They got the Tigers and the Shermans. Apparently, they got over 2,000 customizable vehicles from the last 100 years. He detailed down to their individual components. What the f is that? What the f is that a cat? My brother is a big fan of War Thunder, and he's the one who showed it to me. And compared to Call of Duty, which I always use to play, it is something. Easy to pick up, difficult to master. So check it out yourself with the link below today for free on Xbox, PlayStation, as well as on PC, where my link also gives you a bonus pack full of premium vehicles, boosters, a premium account, and more. Thanks for listening, and thanks to War Thunder for sponsoring me to cover a movie I want to cover instead of another Marvel crap buster. The second key thing Fury does is remain fully faithful to its angle from beginning to end, always looking for freshness within different parts of it. 
As I'm sure you're already getting, this is a tank movie through and through. There are scenes inside a tank, scenes outside a tank, scenes within a close proximity of a tank. We're arguing in a tank, we're cracking jokes on a tank, we're cleaning a tank, we're fighting a tank, it's all tank 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 which is important because that's what the audience can see and remember it for. That's what it stands out as. That's home. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. This may seem obvious, yeah, but always more so after the fact. There's this Guy Ritchie film called The Wrath of Man, for example, which begins with Jason Statham getting a job as an armored truck guard and having to deal with the crappy reality of it. It's all very specific and interesting. Get in the truck next time, you- Sorry, pal. Until all of a sudden, the armor truck angle is tossed away in favor of Jason Statham actually being this badass mob boss looking to get revenge on people. Oh my god, bro. Oh, and I understand why this happens. You can only do so many truck heists before it gets stale and repetitive. True. But the issue is that even though the movie is still pretty good because it's Sky Ritchie, its identity is lost in the process. It's not an armored truck guard movie anymore as it promised to be. It's just this movie. It feels like a like a movie. And so, to avoid this, when you pick a specific angle, you must always play within the constraints of that angle, no matter how hard at times it may be. If in one sequence Brad Pitt's crew left their tank to be part of this aerial mission, it wouldn't be a tank war movie anymore. It would be yet another war movie with tanks and other things, which can work in some media where you have time to specialize in many things, but not so much in movies where you only have two hours. So, even though variety and freshness is vital, you gotta find a way to generate it within your angle, by playing with the dynamics and feelings and whatever, just like Fury. In one sequence, we're pushing in on enemy infantry on an open field in a way that's basically duck hunt with German ducks. In another sequence, we're rolling into a claustrophobic village with dangers around each corner. In another sequence, we're facing a superior tank at a disadvantage and have to survive long enough to gain the advantage. Even at the end, when the tank gets stuck in a crossroads, we never abandon it. Instead, for the entire third act, we use it in a variety of ways to fight an SS battalion. That means using the main cannon. It means using the mounted MGs. It means using a variety of ordnance like white phosphorus. It means having to climb outside the tank to rearm on ammunition and having to keep the enemy back while repurposing the top mounted 30 cal and having to deal with the anti-armor weaponry from before. Overall, the finale revolves around the hard reality of being stuck inside this armored coffin with no chance of escape and the challenges and choices it brings. It is tank warfare for like 20 minutes straight, yet it never gets stale because it keeps evolving. Oh, I want to surrender. Please don't. To be very direct with you, whatever angle you choose, there will be tough writing times where it seems like you can't think of anything more to do with it and where it's tempting to stray away from it just for a bit. But as Brad Pitt would say, please don't. Be faithful to your specialty and honor the promise you've made to the audience. A war movie where a team of heroes fights a battalion of enemies that can be found anywhere. But a war movie where a team of heroes fights a battalion of enemies while stuck inside a metal coffin, that is pretty much exclusive to fury. And as I keep saying, exclusivity is of use only when used. The third key thing Fury does is choose a human angle to tell the tank angle story through, to add that extra bit of emotional specificity. What this means on the surface is that each crew member has their own label-like gist, which helps them stand out as more than just soldiers in a tank. There's the religious believer, the loudmouth hillbilly, the cool as a cucumber Mexican, and the righteous leader tormented by his duty of keeping his men alive in an unrighteous world. 
As I've discussed before, labels like these aren't a substitute for character development, but they do help to quickly distinguish your characters and to generate the content of character scenes. There's a scene where the loudmouth doesn't know how to be civil around civilians. That's the conflict and the drama. There's a scene where the believer gets tested on his beliefs. That's the conflict and the drama and the comedy and everything. That's the scene. Boy, do you think Jesus loves Hitler? We've been talking about the same dumb shit for three years. You know I'm It's who and what these characters are that shapes what their scenes are. Very helpful. Vámonos, cabrón, vámonos. Hey, you want to talk Mexican? Join another tank, Mexican tank. This American tank. But the most important character here is the new recruit, Norman, who has never seen war and yet now must fill the seat of a veteran who was lost to war. Norman is what you'd call the anchoring character, the emotional angle you're taking with your tank angle story. Early on, for example, there's a scene where Norman sees some German kids running in the woods and doesn't shoot because they're kids and he's never shot anyone, which he, along with the audience, must soon face the consequences of. That's your f***ing fault. I don't care if it's a baby with a butter knife in one hand and mama's titty in the other. You chop him up! Sergeant! Later on, after the German tree line forces have been wiped out, Norman gets taken out to a POW to shoot him because, as Brad Pitt puts it, their crew needs killers to stay alive which hammers in the notion that there are no basic heroes and villains here. It's just people killing people. I mean, at one point after we've liberated the village, there's the scene where Norman and Brad Pitt bust into an apartment to find these two Fräuleins and then just gonna play house for a bit. Brad Pitt shaves his beard, Norman plays the piano with the girl and is then forced into the bedroom with the girl where they get a bit closer, after which they all sit down to eat. I mean, it goes on and on and on, to the point where you start to wonder what the point of it is. Why am I watching these soldier heroes hanging out with random German women? What is going on here? Breakfast! Well, as they prepare to head out, that point is delivered with a bang in form of enemy mortars. You gonna raise her up, Norman? Get your ass back up. How you doing? Come on, Let's go, war! You feel it? Yeah, the point of this long house sequence is to show that there is no point, not in war. There was absolutely no reason for this girl to die. Nothing of real meaningful value was gained by anyone with the fact that these mortars rained down to, in the process, blow her up. That's the emotional angle the movie is taking and sailing through the shocked innocent eyes of Norman. That a lot about war is meaningless and that war, war never changes. It will end soon, but before it does, a lot more people gotta die. And the reason this choice of human angle is vital is because it ultimately defines what kind of movie you make. This is a tank movie, yes, but there can be many types of tank movies. Fury without Norman would be a very different experience. It'd feel more like a deadly road trip in Germany with the boys. You can call it tone or whatever you want, but it all comes down to the question of who is the character sitting in the tank and how do they view this world of tanks. I mean, this world of War Thunder. Are they comfortable with it or not? Are they skilled in it or not? Whatever. There's a big difference. Do your job! Do what you're here for! Oh, I'm loading the gun! Hey guys, go, go, go. <laughs> As a whole, two things I want you to do. Firstly, to make your movie stand out in a genre, select a genre angle of what it is, set specific rules and perimeters within that angle and use them, do not stray away from them, and be mindful of what kind of human eyes you're looking at that angle through. After that, also check out War Thunder to get a very cool vehicle war game to play. It's kinda like Fury as a game. They made this video possible, so check out the link below to play for free, and I'll see ya later, tiger.